What's up, everyone? It is December 13th, 2016. Sadly, it is the last episode of this season of The Lobby. But just uh, this season, not forever. Just this season. We'll be back in, what, two or three weeks? Three weeks, I think. Something like that. I don't know. We're all going home for holidays, whatever holiday we're celebrating. Um, but doesn't mean it's going to be any slower of an episode. We have a lot to look forward to in 2017. That's going to be the focus of the episode. Rob Hanley, what's up? You're going to be co-hosting today. P. Cool. Brown. Thanks for having me. Yeah. I mean, you're always on the lobby anyway, but you're like, you're, you're sitting in the Pete Brown seat. He's p- pretty uh, swamped today. It's a hot seat. Yeah. Yeah. He, he leaves it hot. Like, yeah, his yeah. butt is like a lot of heat that emanates cool. from it. That's cool. A man who needs no introduction because of his vile remarks. That's Justin <laughs> Haywald. Uh, Justin's on. So essentially today we're going to go segment by segment, uh, just each platform. What's our like most anticipated group of games for Nintendo in 2017? Xbox, PC, PS4. Um, we had a few other like minor games that we've been talking about recently, but we figured, you know, finale of the season, we'll uh, just kind of look forward to the next one. So yeah, let's start off with Nintendo, our most anticipated games of next year. It's kind of complicated because the Nintendo Switch, we're in that transition period where there aren't a ton of confirmed games. A lot of it might be conjecture, which I'm not averse to getting into, um, you know, acting like we know what's going to happen when we have no clue at all. Um, of, of course, we have the entire slate of Wii U titles coming out next year. I, who can forget? I could. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. No, there, no Wii U <laughs> there, there are literally none except... For, or no, there are. There's, There's Zelda like, Breath of the Wild is going to be on Wii U. Yeah. That's uh, all you need. That's what will be on Wii U first, right? Probably Just Dance. So they haven't said. They've been nice. really cagey uh, about... It. Like, I felt like when they'd first announced it, they, they, had, they had implied they would come out at the same time. So they said Zelda Breath of the Wild is going to come out on Wii U and NX. And I think everybody implied that that meant they would come out at the same time. And they've been very clear after that, after the fact, saying that's not necessarily the case. So I think they're just covering their ass in case Breath of the Wild is going to come out on Wii U and then later on the Switch platform. Although if it's not a launch game, I, that's just a huge mistake. They have yeah, to do yeah, the yeah. Wii GameCube thing where this is the Zelda game that bridges that gap. Was it simultaneous on Wii and, and GameCube? GameCube? Uh, it was the same day? No, no. It, so it came out... I actually think it came out a little bit earlier for Wii, and then it came out afterward for GameCube. And then they I, just I mirrored them. Because mm-hmm. I remember I played it on GameCube first, despite the fact that it came out afterward. And I liked it on GameCube more just because I didn't have the finicky motion controls. It was still a novel experience at the time. But yeah, Breath of the Wild. I remember I was talking to Pete, and I was saying, like, uh, if they do release simultaneously, obviously the Switch is what you want to go for. But mm. who knows if they're going to do that. If they just release on Wii U right away, then... That's what I'll play it on because that game was fun as hell. That's probably my not just my most anticipated Nintendo game next year. That's my most anticipated game. Uh, all three of us played it at E3. I mean, Rob, are you a, like like historically a big Zelda fan? I mean, I've lost touch, but I will say that I you know like Ocarina of Time. I've beaten like four times. Mm-hmm. Like that is just an amazing game. And I think about like in my experiences with with video games, like that is just such a game to adore and. Yeah, everything we've seen at E3, I'm right there with you. It it is by and large like my most ante- anticipated game, yeah. and you know I'm gonna buy that Switch. I mean, I don't, I don't have a, I don't own a Wii U, so that's where I fall in, right? Like I'm part of that market, but it's still weird, right? Like you mm-hmm. want if you're gonna, I don't know, yeah, if you're gonna release and launch a console. Or they, they could do it like they do with the Wii and GameCube, where they're like, we'll put this out on Switch, we know that's going to push consoles, and then we'll put it out on Wii U afterward for people that didn't want to upgrade. But right. You have probably the most well-known video game franchise at your disposal. You might as well use it to mm-hmm. pimp your console. But yeah, that the preview at E3, that was one of the ones where, I mean, even just from that, I think we all played like an hour or something, 45 minutes, and then we all came back to our E3 war room, the news, like the press room, and we were all just be like, dude, did you know you could do this? And then Dave Jewett from the UK was like, I like seesawed, like catapulted myself up. We're like, you could do that? What the fuck? And then like, just from an hour long demo we were doing that, I can't imagine what conversations around this game right. are going to be like when we play the full 20 to 30 hours, whatever it ends up being. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's my most anticipated game period in 2017. It feels like such a modern Zelda. Like, not just the tablet, whatever thing you have as yeah. a character, but it's things like the snowboarding, like just taking your shield and just snowboarding down and carving up some slopes. I don't know. Like there's so many elements of that game that they've adopted uh, that 
just make it so freaking exciting. I it don't know. Is, it is weird because, you know, they're borrowing kind of from A Link Between Worlds and in, in the uh, idea that you can just tackle these dungeons in whatever order you want. At least that's what they're saying. And it's like an actual open world. But at the same time, it it's the closest we've gotten to the original Zelda. Mm-hmm. You know, like just completely open-ended. Zelda, you'd have to find your way and figure out what you're doing. Just by obviously, technical limitations is not going to be nearly as big as Breath of the Wild. But Breath of the Wild seems like a modern... Legend of Zelda as like the original Legend of Zelda, which is super exciting for people that like you know there are people that decry every single Zelda after like the first game. There are the people that think like every game after that. Well, they're insane. They're, I know they they would have but to be. <laughs> it's it's not you know it's not like item gating. Like my favorite Zelda, my favorite game period is Majora's Mask, and it that's nothing like the first Zelda. Mm-hmm. But Breath of the Wild looks like it's taking like modern sensibilities, like to satisfy modern palettes and combine it with like, like a lot of things like doom returned to its roots this year. Right. seems like resident evil might be doing that. We'll be talking about that later in the show. Uh, just a ton of games, like, I don't know, final fantasy kind of branched off, but a lot of these iconic franchises seem to be kind of getting back in touch with what made them great to begin with, which is exciting. Well, speaking about the technical limitations of what breath of the wild will, will well, well, other Zelda games would have been like, like there will have to be some scaling back for this because this is a game that runs on Wii U, just like the Wii and GameCube version. We don't know a lot about what the Switch's capabilities are, but but I guess some of the games that have been teased, I'm not even sure what we're getting with them. Like, so we are pretty sure there's going to be a Mario Kart experience of some type. There's going to yeah. be a Splatoon experience of some type. And a 3D but, Mario, right? And a 3D Mario. That looks completely new, but with Mario Kart and Splatoon, are these going to be updates to an existing game? Do you, if you have them digitally, are you going to be able to tie into that somehow? Because it, it has a, or we've been told, and we've seen it, that it doesn't have a disc system. So you're not going to be able to use your Wii U disc in this. It has to have a separate cartridge. Okay, right, yeah, so what, would it be just people thinking it's a port of the Wii U version to the Switch? It doesn't look... What else could it be? What we saw of Splatoon and Mario Kart didn't look substantially different. Yeah. It, so it, so w- what is it going to be? You're saying that, like, you could, you know, you could buy your spe- specific console cartridge or disc, but you're saying, are you advocating that, like, maybe it's worthwhile to do, like, an eShop thing? Like, would... Purchasing the game on like eShop then allow you to play it on both. I feel like they have to. I mean, yeah. Nintendo has always been really behind on that, but they've also had great backwards compatibility. Generally, every console has been backwards compatible with the generation before that, and this is the first one. This is the first major console in a long time where that's impossible unless they have some other peripheral. So, if I already own Splatoon, what's going to make me want to buy this? Is is it going to be a full price game? Like, would that be a new experience? Would this be a twenty dollar? additional like just competitive thing like I, I'm really curious how that's going to work like Splatoon is obviously going to be another game there's going to be a Splatoon 2 at some point but I don't think that what we saw when they teased it was Splatoon 2 that felt like the Splatoon we already play just with more competitive options uh, to go on to another title Justin you mentioned a rumor that there might be a third entry in the Pokemon Sun Moon mm-hmm. group on the Switch so so we know they, there's that there's going to be another Pokemon game. They've been clear about that. And I, I think the rumor, the conjecture right now, is is just like the old Pokemon games would have a third iteration that came out about a year afterward. Uh, like uh, Diamond and Pearl would get platinum, or uh, red and green got yellow. That some people are conjecturing that we're from Sun and Moon, we're going to get stars or something along those lines. And that will be a Wii U exclusive version of Sun and Moon. I have no idea how that would work. Like, is that... Is that just going to be an upscaled 3DS version? Because the 3DS version of Sun and Moon is already pushing the 3DS to the limits in a lot of ways. You you don't get a lot of games that have slowdown on the 3DS, but Sun and Moon is actually pushing the 3DS a little too far, even Mm. on the new 3DS. So so I think that's believable. And then, uh, I mean, as as far as third-party titles go, (laughs) you know, people are starting to announce, kind of confirm. uh, Was Skyrim officially confirmed as of now, or is it still weird? So it's not official, but it's it's really weird. If you have a launch trailer for a console, and you have that much time on screen dedicated to a game like Skyrim, like, I think maybe Bethesda's just not ready to announce it. They wanted to do that on their own time. Uh, It would be really weird if that is not a confirmed game. But that's real. I think that's really positive in the the grander scheme because it means Nintendo is thinking about third parties again and not just like making separate titles for the Switch, but here, you know, tapping into the zeitgeist of what are the big games right now. Skyrim is is huge. Getting that onto the Switch, like that would be a really crazy, amazing experience. You'd have a portable Skyrim. 
Yeah, and then to look a little farther ahead, there's uh, a couple of smaller teams announced games for the Nintendo mm-hmm. Switch. Seasons of Heaven will be an exclusive, but it's it's not released in 2017, despite that being our conversation. This is a 2018 Switch exclusive, but it's about it's from a French studio. It's about Jan, a young boy with Asperger's syndrome, and his French bulldog Ani. Both characters are playable, and according to a Google translated article from French game blog Game Blog, <laughs> the title is currently running on Unreal Engine 4. This is all from a GameSpot article by Jason Imms. Uh, and then also there is The Sacred Hero, which will also be on PC, but we don't know a ton about it. It's, just, mm-hmm. it's from a developer, Simplistic. Um, but that is also slated to release in 2018. So that's two of the smaller titles. I did want to look at possible conjecture. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think all of us kind of hope Metroid's going to come back in a big way at some point, whether it be a you know first person like Prime or you cool. know, well, we third had, person. This generation, we haven't had a... a Metroid game. We had nothing on the Wii U. On the 3DS, we had Prime Federation Force, right. which, which I wasn't a fan of. I don't think. I don't think many you, people were. You don't right? count that as a Metroid. Yeah. Uh, like going back to that, the first person roots. Like this is this would 100 percent be the time to do that, and especially in the U.S. Like Metroid Prime was such a such a popular series, such a popular direction to take that Metroid formula. It would be insane not to go back to that. Yeah, I mean, it seems even more so than the Wii U that Switch seems tailor-made for a, some sort of, you know, classic Metroid game between the handheld options available mm-hmm. and the actual just, you know, I don't think it would be that hard to, mm-hmm. I'd, I'm kind of, I'm, you know, being reductive, but I'm, I just want a 2D Metroid game or even a Prime game. I love the Prime trilogy, even Echoes, which I think a lot of people say is their least favorite. I just, I want a Metroid game really badly. And if Breath of the Wild and a Metroid game, I'm already sold for the Switch. Like, I really want one. And if they brought a Metroid out next year, that would just be game breaker. It would is, be weird if they didn't. Oh, sorry. Is uh, is the Switch going to be touch screen? Was that confirmed or not? I, I feel like, like they stylus. Haven't. Yeah, I feel like they haven't said specifically one way or the one way or the other. <laughs> there, it, that's still rumor. It's a conjecture that there is some capacitive surface on it which responds to touch. But Nintendo has not said, like, I don't think we're going to learn any more concrete details about the system until January. Mm. So, yeah, January is the next big, like, uh, news. That's when the next news rolls out for the Switch. Mm -hmm. Uh, What is the tentative release? March? Uh, Tentative release is sometime in March. Okay, cool. (laughs) We'll we'll probably, we'll definitely learn that in January. So January, I think, 13th, they're going to have a press conference, which, you know, you can watch on GameSpot.com. That'll be from Tokyo. And then soon after that, we're going to have events all across the globe. So our Australian office, our UK office, and here in San Francisco, we're all going to get a chance to, uh, to try it out. Cool. So, yeah, those are the games we are looking forward to for uh, Nintendo in 2017. Let us know if we missed any in the comments and uh, tell us what you're excited for. All right, Justin, thanks for uh, sharing your Nintendo Thank expertise you. as always. I'm going to boot you off quick for uh, Hi. Jake Decker's coming on. going to talk Xbox One. Something's up with the mic. No, nothing's wrong. Tay's shaking his head. That was a good joke. Yeah. It's just a, you know, a little red herring for the people watching. Uh, so, yeah, these... You're picky as hell, aren't you? Yeah. He likes coming the newer, on the show. He likes the newer one. Jake, what's yeah. up? Not much. We're going to talk about uh, Xbox One games soon, but uh, I want to know, what are you playing right now? Uh, I just finished Final Fantasy. I finished Hitman. Hitman. <laughs> he does that every time. Like, well, I mean, technically, it is, there's, uh, a, there's a bunch of episodes, right? It's kind of like a hit, hit men. Yeah, Hitman. It's a bunch of men. No, but he says Hitmen. Like, no, I Pikmin. say Hitmen. I heard hit, hit, hit men. Whatever. Uh, um, and then I'm going to start Last Guardian. Soon. So I'm not I, playing anything. I finally, I think people around the office that I keep complaining to have been waiting for me to get to the point where I like it. I'm there. I like that game a lot more. Oh, now. did you recently? Because this yes. was this was Last Monday. Night. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I was complaining a lot coming in yesterday morning. Yeah. Last night I played another four hours. I, uh, I think there were what, sixteen chapters. I think I'm on twelve. Gosh, are there even chapters? That's like the 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 areas. If you look up, so I looked up like Trico commands to make it a little easier. Like, I didn't want to, obviously, look up puzzle solutions. Oh, you, you, you no, but like, was. no, Trigo commands. There are, dude, there are, like, helpful tips for that game that I'm they sure don't teach you. I'm sure there are, yeah. Uh, so I looked those up and made it much better, and I'm also at the point where, past the point where Trico is just this, like, uncooperative pet. Yes. He still, he still, he still is, a, like, a being of his own, but I'm, I'm getting much more used to, like, dealing with him. It's and crazy. dealing with me. It's crazy how I was going through the exact same thing. I mean, it, I guess it's not crazy, but what's, it's just, it's crazy how close to... F this game, I don't want to play. 
I'm not anymore. looking forward I, I to was, playing this. No, but it's it's, <laughs> it's, it's honestly it's weird. It's, it's weird, like, and it's hard to say like whether that's intentional or not. I mean, I'd say parts of it definitely are, but there are just there's just not much guidance. So you just get like again, like coming home after work, it could be really hard to turn that thing on. Like I'm exhausted. I waited a while. Yeah, I, I played over the weekend, but yeah, sure enough. No, it's so worth it. Like you get to a point where it's just you just understand how everything works and then yeah. it starts speeding up and it is definitely awesome. <laughs> maybe I'll wait till the weekend to start then. Yeah, yeah. maybe definitely. I'm stressed out and tired or something because that will exacerbate those feelings. Um, anyway, we're here to talk about our most anticipated Xbox One games of next year. Um, some of these throughout the show today. For those watching live, we're going to be kind of crisscrossing between platforms. So some of these won't be Xbox One exclusives. They might be, you know, PS4, PC, but we're kind of like divvying them up. And then these breakouts will not go up until like the 22nd, I think, when we actually start, you know, doing our most anticipated stuff on the site. Um, anyway, Xbox One, I have crack... No, Scalebound first. Scalebound was... <laughs> that demo <laughs> at uh, E3 was kind of funny for all of us just between the... Uh, the, the <laughs> jargon was, that okay so the main character's name is drew so it's from platinum games you know of bayonetta uh, metal gear rising revengeance fame they're also working on near automata which we're getting into later in the ps4 segment um yeah this dude drew is working with a dragon thubin or tubin i don't know how to pronounce it completely but we watched the demo to e3 and he was just fighting this massive boss kind of like a devil may cry slash bayonetta taking last on guardian a giant boss thing. it's i was about to say it's <laughs> almost like the Colossus very kind of much the opposite of last guardian as far as tone <laughs> yeah yeah i mean between you know the war cries they have and the you apparently you can just uh snap into a first person mode to control the dragon every once in a while but obviously look at like looking at this gameplay here uh you see this giant massive crab boss rising out of the water that we end up fighting uh you know bow and arrow apparently there will be like firearms later that degrade over time it's an rpg action rpg it's billed as so you know be ranking up your character throughout picking up new weapons i'm sure uh it looks fun i would say uh especially if they can kind of nail that dragon slash human combat almost like titanfall maybe the balance between different two different scales scale bound yeah. um yeah what do you guys think of this game jake did you uh play have we has have any of us played any of this or i have all just played it i think it, it looks cool i remember I, maybe it was this e3 or the last e3 they showed a demo and it was running like garbage yeah like it was had poor frame rate it didn't look that good but looking at this, this looks this looks pretty cool. Yeah, like, I, I I I'm curious like how long I'd actually be able to play this though. Like I feel like it might get monotonous after a while. But I mean the scale is definitely there. The thing going for it obviously is Platinum Games. I mean they That's it always true, yeah. seems a little bit monotonous at first. Just that kind of basic balance of range and close up attacks. But then you keep playing these games like Bayonetta or Metal Gear Rising, and they just keep getting more nuanced as you go, and they know how to pace their games. So or Legend of Korra, which was pretty bad. I didn't like, play Legend of Korra. They, they range bad. so much. Like I don't know what to expect with Platinum Games. Either it's going to be great, or it's just going to be like kind of dumb. Yeah, you're totally right. I mean, again, the most recent thing I played by them was Near Automata a preview. Again, we're talking about that later on the show, the live show. But it it definitely looks like something I want to play. Just watching this. Uh, you know, you get up close and this is just boss that fights, obviously. I'm sure not everything butt. is as big, but I, I don't know what that was. I have a hard time understanding what exactly you're doing in this game, though. It, is it an open world? I've seen clips of, like, you and the dragon, like, just out in a field and stuff, and then there's these boss battles. What is, like, the three-word classification of this game? So it's, I mean, they're saying action RPG. Okay. So I don't know that it's going to be open world. Uh, I know, like, Nier Automata will be. This might be kind of more... A linear Devil May Cry thing with like these I feel like sandbox. We've, yeah, I feel like we've seen like sandbox areas for this. Like, yeah, because Bayonetta was entirely linear. Yeah. I Isn't, remember. There's supposed to be co op too, right? Or multiplayer or something? Yeah. Wasn't it four players taking on that boss during E3? Yeah. 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 Uh, I don't know. Like, it, it looks promising. I'd like to see, you know, see it in action, obviously. Uh, not sure exactly when that releases. I can check that yeah, out. Yeah, they've uh, been working on it for a while too. Definitely, yeah. So it's because they announced it a few years ago, right? Yeah, it was like I a, what it was. Is it like Gamescom or something like that? It was like definitely three years a while. ago. Yeah, there's no exact release date. It's still 2017 for uh, Xbox One, Microsoft Windows. So hopefully we'll hear more about that. If not like before E3, then at E3 or something. Um, Crackdown Three, which I think everybody kind of got excited about when they saw the uh, Microsoft Azure powered uh, destruction. 
uh, just essentially you can level the whole city if you're running. I think Pete Brown would be good to talk to about this. He understands like the technical uh, components of it. But yeah, what seemed destroy like destroy the city. It was using a cloud server type type of yes. process yeah. where like a build each building in a certain area would be devoted to a server and operate it on the cloud. So sure. like if you were blowing up one building, it would they basically asked, I think I saw up to like they had like a uh, like a debug and they were showing like up to like twelve different servers mm -hmm. when like you were leveling like you know like a whole block. That game looks insane. They were showing like uh, footage of like a guy basically just like shooting a wall and was able to create a hole to snipe out of. Uh, the destructible environment of that whole city sounds insane. Ambitious, but yeah, yeah ambitious. If they could pull it off. Definitely fun. I, the first Crackdown, I played a lot. That was one of my Same. early Xbox 360 games. That was like that in Call of Duty 2, if I recall correctly. I did not like the second one all that much. It felt really repetitive in what you were asked to do. But yeah, just once you start getting all those agility orbs and just... This is like a behind-the-scenes documentary we're watching. But at, once you get all those agility orbs, you could leap like up 20-story buildings with one jump. You just become so overpowered in the best way. And uh, combining that with these destructible environments that they're promising would... Sounds pretty awesome. Well, like if you see it on a building, wouldn't you just level the building and then pick it up off the ground? <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, it's kind of the opposite of what I would want to do, just destroy everything. Um, and, and tack on the fact that it was, it was I believe it was co-op that it, they, they showed footage of, like um, I forget where I saw it, but... Uh, yeah, all of them have been co-op, so yeah. I'm pretty sure this one, I mean, it makes sense for this one to be co-op as well. It'd be weird. That's one of its tenets. I would be, I would be surprised if they uh, kind of just... Did without it this time. Yeah, Crackdown was like one of the first oh, sort of open world games that had co-op. I thought that was so cool. And yeah, it came it was out. Great. Like, uh, do you do like I don't know, LAN connection and just like yeah. be screwing around the city with a friend? Yeah, it took a while to wrap your head around the fact that you could do that with games back in like 2007 or whatever it was. But yeah, this looks promising to say the least. It's just I don't know. No other games have kind of like tried to do this yet with the cloud. Uh, so I'm looking Jeez. forward to seeing what happens. Oh, it's ridiculous. just this domino effect. Watching across it, the city. yeah. <laughs> Obviously, this is pre-alpha, but I'm really curious to, to see what they end up doing with like NPCs or creating people in this city, right? Because sure, leveling it would be a whole lot of fun, but you know, <laughs> just people going is, about their it, daily business, <laughs> or is it just empty? You know, I, don't, I'm, yeah. I mean, it won't be that obviously, but I'm just curious to see like the actual city and yeah, like what operation. Was, what was the deal with the first two games? There were NPCs all over the city, right? There yeah, weren't, few. or like not many, right? Yeah, there weren't no, many. No, not a lot. Did the second one, there was like a zombie outbreak or that something. That was the whole thing. Like you were kinda, going to these zombie nests yeah. and then figuring out how to destroy those. Um, I don't know what the actual like civilian population was like. I imagine the first game wasn't too populated if it was like an early Xbox 360 game. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking forward to that, though. Yeah. Uh, another one we have listed here, which is not just like Xbox One exclusive, Prey, which I am really, really excited for, mainly because I love... Dishonored 2, which I just finished, and it's also Arcane Studios. It's following in the vein of, uh, you know, Looking Glass Games, Deus Ex, Thief, System Shock, that kind of first-person choice and consequence, uh, you know, like story-driven adventure. Um, Dishonored 2 is, you know, we keep talking about it around the office. It's uh, a great game that we really enjoyed. I myself really like. I loved the first Dishonored. Um, Prey is the other side of Arcane Studios, so Harvey Smith being creative director of uh, Dishonored 2, Raph Colantonio over in France will be heading up Prey, or is heading up Prey. Uh, I can't wait for this. I mean, it's cool. Like, the story itself, the premise is cool. So, essentially, it's based on the fact that JFK survived the assassination on 11-22-63, uh, and then, like, continued pouring funds into space research. So, to the fact, to the point where we were actually, like, pretty progressive in space, and then awesome. aliens took notice. So, and you are Morgan Yu on a space station, which, again, this is all just system shock like on a space station the original prey on 360 which i didn't play much i think people kind of consider a cult classic right i i, I remember, played it yeah i, I remember being sick because you'd like run up like upside down yeah. and like be yeah around. that was like a launch title wasn't it it was close to launch i think it was like a couple months after yeah. so yeah but i mean this one you can transform into coffee mugs you can you know <laughs> just to get through space it just looks wacky it's it seems like Dishonored 2, but obviously sci-fi and just on acid. Also dark. Like the the whatever alien mm -hmm. villain it is in this game looks creepy as all hell. Like, yeah, it, like, like something out of a dream or, half or a nightmare. Oh, I can't wait for this. I mean, it seems like it, combining kind of the isolation of alien and, you know, that choice-driven uh, gameplay of 
Dishonored, those games I mentioned, the, the looking glass vein of games that people have been so uh, affected by, even like Origin Systems back in the day. I can't wait for this. This, uh, I don't know if this has an actual release date yet. I think Prey is, uh, yeah, I mean, 2017 right now, but I... It just looks like it's going all out, like batshit crazy with things you could do, and then obviously you're getting like these sci-fi weapons that are, are becoming kind of iconic. Yeah. I uh, I never I didn't play that original one. The the story too, like it seems more interesting than Dishonored too. Like Dishonored's world, I think is is one of the best things about that game. But the story is kind of weak. And this, at least judging by like the trailer they've showed, they've shown the premise seems super interesting. Like I feel like they could do something really cool with this story. Yeah, definitely. Uh, again, this is not a Xbox One exclusive per se. It's on PS4 and Microsoft Windows as well. But figured we would slide it into this segment because uh, we got a lot of PS4 and Xbox One games to talk about. Mm-hmm. But anyway, I don't know about you guys. You miss anything else? I mean, we, we're talking about Mass Effect and Andromeda on the PC section. Uh, Yuka Laylee, do you guys play? Were you big fans of Banjo Kazooie and Tui? Yeah, I definitely uh, played Banjo Kazooie. Um, I played that. What they call it? The toy box or something? The or toy the, box. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. I don't know. I mean, granted, that was just, uh, you know, essentially uh, the ability just to kind of try out the movement and get a general, very general idea of maybe, you know, what that game would feel like. Um, I I don't know. I, you know, people, you know, it's, it's, it's a crowdfunding or, or uh, yep. yeah, I mean, that's, that's all good. I think people are really excited for it and I'm definitely like happy people are. I, I just don't see much value personally out of it. I mean, it just looks exactly like Banjo Kazooie. Yeah, I'm excited for it, but yeah, like you said, it's I'm excited because it's kind of reviving the 3D platformer, which is you know all but almost disappeared in recent years, except for like Knack, or <laughs> that has a sequel, <laughs> so maybe it is coming back. Who knows? But I played about an hour of this actually uh, when I was over in London. Um, Platonic showed me a, a section of the game. They just kind of let me wander around and collect. Uh, I forgot that it so obviously it was like jiggies, jigsaw pieces in Banjo Kazooie and Tui. I was collecting like pages in this. Um, it felt really good. Um, some camera issues, which yeah. obviously like three D platformers, you know, are made or broken by their their cameras, like The Last Guardian. Um, but I'm looking forward to it. Um, it's this again. This isn't an Xbox One exclusive. It's a releasing on all platforms but yeah it, yeah they, I totally was gonna say that um, that was the one like major gripe where like you know. At what point, for like any kind of third-person game, do you do you allow you know a, a camera to like auto turn or auto auto follow? Because it felt like you were really it was really stiff in that uh, toy box. At least I played. Um, like you just felt like you were fighting the camera and it was getting lodged in like walls and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, hopefully they address that. And then uh, one I do want to mention as well. Uh, I didn't really have a ton of fun with the first Battlefront. Not the first Battlefront, but like the 2015 EA reboot, the EA Battlefront. They are I, slated for a 2017 release, or at least like rumored or whatever. Uh, Battlefront 2 will be releasing. Um, I don't know what to expect from it. I think we've heard some things about this. I don't know what we're supposed to talk about yet, so I'm not even going to risk anything. But well, yeah. I mean, I know what I want. What do you want? I want campaign. Yeah. Duh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, I want like a Galactic Conquest type of idea yes. with that. <laughs> Please. Because uh, that was, that was the, the best most mode addicting part. Two. Yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, in both those games. Space but battles. Two, space battles would be great. Just being able to switch sides and just yeah. like have a completely different <laughs> like I mean, tone to everything. I mean, yeah. Rogue One releases in two days. You have Force Awakens out already. We know like it just seems like Star Wars is in full on push. It seems weird not to take advantage of <coughs> of all these new stories, excuse me, that are right. kind of coming out in each of these movies. A campaign would make sense. And and that is the biggest, uh, I would say, maybe an overall like gripe with like a lot of these Star Wars games lately. And you could even vouch for like some of the latest movies. Is this is a franchise that I think I, I don't even want to call it a franchise, a universe that so many people adore. However, what's getting tiresome is seeing so much of that original trilogy. Like, come on, let's take some liberties. Let's push things things forward. Yeah. Uh, you know, Battlefront lacked in that, and even some of the DLC that came afterwards, uh, just like the last one, is like an, X, an X-Wing. You're in space, and what do you get to fly? Just an X-Wing. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> like, like This is like a B-Wing. There are so many things, as far as an arsenal, that you could have and, and create that I just you're just not seeing a lot of creativity in. in uh, and, I, you know, and that, you know, you could also vouch that that's the reason why Lucasfilm, maybe... 
that's the roadblock, right? Like you have to like go through them and it's mm-hmm. very tight and I'm, as it should be, you know, it's canon. You got to like adhere to the rules, but you imagine just, EA and Dice though could probably get that, get access to that pretty easily though. You know, yeah. like, well, like and just to keep vamping on that, uh, the uh, Star Wars X-Wing um, VR mission that came out with Battlefront, those guys who made the game were able to basically design an X-Wing cockpit and then show it to Lucasfilm and they said, that's awesome. This is now canon. Yeah. Like I interviewed those guys at one of the last preview events and it was freaking awesome. Like there are people who are, I feel like kind of taking that route, but I'm just sick and tired of like an at walk. Like, Hoth. <laughs> thank you. Hoth. Can we get off that planet? And just maybe the idea of like an at and Walker salt, like just like an unbalanced, I don't know, premise that it's just tired. It's just been done. Like I just want battlefront to be, something new well what about so the original battlefront 2 they started incorporating the prequel trilogy that's fine by me yeah and if it's just like all military stuff then that's fine as long as you don't get too much into the story of the prequels that's where you kind of enter rocky waters but do you think that like you just played dlc recently can you talk about it yet yeah absolutely you can't right now rogue one it's rogue one yeah so do you think they'll take more advantage of that in battlefront 2 because from i'm reading early reviews from all like major publications saying rogue one's pretty good right and there's apparently like the third act well i won't even say it but like apparently there's a lot of cool like choreographed battles and like special effects and the battles themselves are actually much larger scale than you might think based on trailers in rogue one that we've seen so far yeah i wonder if they'll take advantage of that with battlefront 2 yeah and i think a lot of it is just time like you know you look at battlefront i think even frankly this dlc wasn't all that outstanding to me and you just get the real obvious indication that these are games that were that were stripped of a single player campaign in order to make Force Awakens deadline, right? Like once I think and hopefully, you know, like you have uh, like Respawn working on some Star Wars title, like once we can get, I'd say like another year in, maybe Battlefront, like they're hopefully they're doing, you know, a lot spending a lot more time on it. Yeah. That we can start start seeing some really cool Star Wars games. Uh, I just feel like now it's like it's back. Star Wars is back. Let's yeah. like mass produce this franchise like a Marvel case and games are like following behind it. And that's the problem is like, you know, you, game doesn't like come out in a year. Sure. Like this isn't really platform centric, but obviously like the Star Wars game that Amy Hennig is working on. I can't wait for that. I don't know if it's going to be 2017 or not. Um, that used to be 1313. Uh, she's working on it with Visceral Studios. So we'll see what, uh, happens with that maybe we'll hear more about that next year but of course that's going to be very narratively driven knowing amy hennig's experience with you know like the uncharted franchise uh, as an example that's exciting but yeah so obviously we wish we had more time but those are a handful of our favorite x or our most anticipated xbox one games coming out in 2017 so if we missed any or we have any major ones that you want to talk about leave your thoughts in the comments below state of decay <laughs> state of decay yeah well we'll get to that another time yeah that's yeah. only that's xbox oh yeah state of decay 2 is uh yeah, Xbox exclusive. Yeah, if we have more time, we could talk about it. No, but uh, we just go straight on to PC. Is it on PC too? We could talk about PC. Is probably. it on Windows? It's probably going to be I'll on Windows. I'll check that out. But first, we'll start with uh, <laughs> Mass Effect Andromeda is an easy one. Hold on, let me intro this better. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Our most anticipated PC games of 2017. Uh, I want to start with Mass Effect Andromeda. Again, this isn't the only platform it's releasing on, but I think it's the one that like most of us will play it on just in terms of uh, graphical fidelity and whatnot. Uh, Jake, you're a huge Mass Effect fan. What are you excited for most with Andromeda? I am most excited for a return to sort of the RPG roots that the series was kind of known for. It sounds like they're taking that and they're expanding on that even bigger. Like the planet diversity is a lot. There's a lot more planet. There's a lot more diverse planets. There's a lot more room to explore. Uh, the Mako, well, the Mako isn't back. It's the, But there's a ground vehicle you can use to explore. Uh, my... I mean, I, I'm super excited for this game. I can ramble about this for a long time. Yeah, so for those who aren't, haven't been following it feverishly, you play as either Sarah or Scott Ryder. You just pick your gender and go with it uh, as, like, it replaces Commander Shepard. You're sent on the Andromeda Initiative. Obviously, it's, like, our closest neighboring galaxy, despite the fact that it's still <clears throat> how many light years away. I forget. I did an entire article on it, like, what science tells us about the Andromeda Galaxy. We're supposed to mesh, like, how far into the future... Yeah, there's, the there's essentially there's yeah, a super yeah. collision that's gonna happen, yeah. and it's crazy. Tomorrow, yeah, it's, it's crazy. just it's <laughs> tomorrow. Yeah, the Andromeda Galaxy is just on our doorstep. <laughs> no, it's crazy actually. Like uh, I was reading yeah. up on it, 
a lot. I did way too much research for this like 800 word article. But apparently when these galaxies start colliding and absorbing each other, the the suns will form a black hole at the center. But each individual planet in the solar system is so far apart from the next they won't collide at all. In fact, like it'll be it won't even affect each other that much. The gravitational pull won't affect. So it'll just be this massive galaxy that's formed. And then everything will get sucked into the black holes and then shot into like other dimensions essentially, like at such high speeds and distances that like they're not gonna be planets anymore. They're gonna be these rocks floating in there. So Sounds Earth like Earth itself will just Whoa. be like I will survive. You guys probably won't. But um <laughs> No, I was kidding. Um oh, are they serious? <laughs> uh, but yeah, also like a big difference with, like you said, they're going back to RPG roots. The first Mass Effect did have more of those as opposed to like two, which was kind of RPG slash third person cover based shooter, which three I felt went more toward action. Mm -hmm. cover -based yeah, shooter. I mean, they did bring back some of the RPG elements with three, but it was like it's had like giant set pieces and explosions and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and But what makes Mass Effect, at least why I love Mass Effect so much, are the quiet moments. Like when you're on your ship, when you're talking to people and it sounds like they are doubling down on that. Like there's different, I mean, you're going to have, uh, there's like the ship, the Tempest, which you can explore. And then there's another ship, the Ark, which is sort of like the hub area in this game. And it sounds like there'll be plenty of those character driven moments, which is what I'm looking forward to. The Tempest is your Normandy for all intents and purposes, right? Yeah. So it's the replacement of the Normandy. Okay. And then the Nomad is, that's what, the Nomad is the replacement of the it's, Mako. It's where you're going to make sweet, hot love to aliens with Probably. tentacle hair. Hopefully. There is also the fact that you don't have to pick between those three classes or three hybrid classes at the beginning. You just start as Sarah or Sky Rider, and then you just build out your skills however you want them. It's almost like a, uh, uh, what's the run in uh, Dark Souls 2 and Dark Souls 3, the Dark Souls series where you're deprived run, deprived. where you start with like no skills, no pre you, like no predetermined path. You can just build however you want. Apparently that's how Andromeda is going to be more along yeah, those lines. Yeah, I actually... I wouldn't be surprised. It seems like the way it's going, but then like Jean-Luc and I actually did like a trailer breakdown. And if you notice, like classes would have different color uh, shields, at least in the main game, or at least in one, two, and three, or two and three. And then in this one, like the shields are different sometimes. Sometimes they're blue. Sometimes they're purple. Gotcha. That's like a little detail, but <clears throat> okay. um, that's, yeah, I don't know. The... Uh that's the thing that has me most excited for this game, actually, is just because, I mean, the first one was more of an RPG, right? But it also still felt pretty clunky. Like, I, I loved how 2 kind of took that those third-person elements and, uh, you know, cover-based shooting and made that, you know, let me enjoy those quieter moments more because the combat wasn't so frustrating. And the Mako's coming back, like you said, but I don't know if I want that. Like, if they can make it fun. Like, I know there are people that just love the Mako. I can't stand those. So things. I hated the Mako in the first one. But, it, I mean, <laughs> it seems like they're taking the steps they need to make this Mako or Nomad actually pilot like it should. Yeah. Drive you, like it should. And I would argue, though, that you didn't hate the Mako. You hated the barren, boring planet. Or the, yeah. like, fortresses <laughs> you had to assault that had, like, six turrets on this right. gate. And then you go through. Every room was just, six turrets. was just... Uh, crates inside of it right yeah. and, and then there's one like new helmet you got out yeah of it. i would i would like i mean you know this is just dreams but i would really like that ability like i think two kind of did a lot of that where you were and i thought it was cool it was like just probing a planet like i have no problem having that <laughs> like no man's sky boring ass planet <laughs> as long as you don't have to land on it right yeah like if there was the solution of like, hey, this is actually a uh, pretty hab habitable or lush planet with like um, you know a bunch of krogans on it, like mm -hmm. cool. Now I can I can know I know that if I land there, I can spend a lot of time there and talk to people and get stories and stuff. Like that that direction was like what I loved about two. Yeah, I don't want to land on like Andromeda's version of North Dakota. No right. offense to the viewers <laughs> in North Dakota, it just doesn't seem like there's much going on in a lot of that state or like Antarctica. Exactly. That would be a less offensive one. Or like no the one moon. Any planet in No Man's Sky. Yeah. <laughs> no, the harsh. moon. That was harsh. Yeah. We all just took digs at certain states and games. <laughs> um, all right. Moving on from that. This one I'm actually really excited for. I don't know if either of you guys have played Divinity Original Sin. Let me restart that. Divinity Original Sin. Divinity Original Sin 2 from Larian Studios, the Belgian developer, is releasing next year. I played a bunch of previews of this game. I love the first one. It's actually... It's not underrated. People praised it very, very highly. It was GameSpot's PC Game of the Year uh, two years ago, 2014, if I'm not mistaken. And then uh, it's just isometric, like 
old school Western RPG uh, party based combat and exploration. It and then the combat becomes turn based. But if you guys are into that at all, you should play the first one to get ready for this because this game looks unreal. It actually, like full disclosure, Kevin Van Ord, former reviews editor yeah. of GameSpot, is uh, writing, helping write this game. Yeah. Um, you know, like it's a fantasy RPG and uh, there's uh, also like PVP elements to this, which didn't sound like anything I wanted, but I played a few previews. Actually really fun. Like it's, you get uh, three characters against three and it's, or no, you get one versus one. They might be introducing new maps, but you get uh, like a, like a, these lizard characters of like an, a new undead class that's in this game uh, as you're building out your party. And then you can, you know, like the combat in this game is awesome. It's all experimentation based and all kind of like a cause and effect right like so there's this barrel up on top of the scaffolding and then knowing this mage is better at a distance and from a height you lob you predetermine that you're going to lob like a fire grenade or a fireball onto it so then when they go up it'll just be burning they'll have to come down which will allow your warrior to get up close it's i'm like kind of being reductive right now but there's a lot of nuance and a lot of layers to its combat that actually makes the pvp really fun obviously just based on this gameplay right here if you played the first one you know it can be pretty menu heavy uh, text heavy if you're ready, if you're just like ready to get really absorbed in a game, play the first one because it, it's really rewarding. The story's great. The characters are awesome. And obviously, like the main character being the one you're fleshing out, um, two looks looks fantastic. And I cannot wait for this. Um, it is, yeah, slated for 2017, but I hope it comes very soon. Um, anyway, do you guys have any thought? You don't have any thoughts about Divinity. I think I don't you played it. I, I'll, I'll yeah. keep pimping it if you want. No, no. Yeah. I mean, that sounds I'm really cool. excited for that game. It looks great. It's awesome. Plays great from what I played. Um, Pyre, uh, Super Giant Games of Bastion and Transistor fame. It's their newest game. It looks like a football game at first, but it's also an RPG. It's also this third person adventure. It's pretty fun from what I played. Have you guys gotten hands on with it at all? Uh, no, I've, I've seen a lot of it. I mean, yeah. stylistically and it's, it's art style, it looks wild and like yeah. just wacky and, and not wacky, I would say, but. Very original. Yeah, like, yeah you, it's you can't so really different from the other stuff. Yeah, you can't really like point at any kind of era. Almost, I don't even know what it is. Oh, it's a, when I'm trying to describe the genre to people, I say imagine a turn-based combat RPG where the combat is fantasy football and <laughs> not, <laughs> not, big, a big space not, in between those, na- <laughs> yeah. those words, where the combat is football set in a fantasy world not fantasy football <laughs> you're not fucking okay. like getting together to draft people um yeah you get you get three characters to begin with I, I think it expands later but of course like there's a small one who's really good at dashing has extra dash and then you're just passing this ball around trying to get it into the other players like end zone for all intents and purposes but then the maps become more intricate it turns out it's like this tournament to like free yourself from slavery so it has like that That's gladiator right. aspect right it's like russell crowe trying to open his shackles and whatnot but you know but then you have like this huge story in between you have this camp you go to to upgrade your characters and kind of build new items and whatnot you know the rpg elements in between uh the writing the, the art style's gorgeous like even just these characters that pop up during the dialogue look on amazing it you could definitely tell it's like inspired by transistor and transistor and bastion and you know what really threw me off in a really great way <laughs> that was the music i found the music uh like to have a very like interesting contrast with like everything that was going on because it has a very like fantasy element to it, but like I remember hearing like almost like a like a rock distorted bass groove that was just felt it made it made it feel like a space frontier type sure. of type of uh, style. Is. Yeah, and it's weird because you see one of the more intricate maps here, and you have like the large character, you have the the main one in the middle, you have the smaller one that scampers around. Uh, it becomes a little more. It's like rock, paper, scissors at first and how you attack someone with a ball or defend from it. But then it becomes more about kind of the overarching structure of the game is really appealing to me because these bite sized the actual combat or the actual events, what you want to call them, sporting events, that's like the, the bite sized things that you just really learn the intricacies of a pretty simple game like Gwent or, you know, like chess, which seems simple at first, but then you realize how complicated it can be. But then you have this like overarching RPG and it's not open world. You're going from point to point along a map from what I remember. And that's where like the, you know, like umbrella story comes into play and kind of contextualizes it all and makes it memorable from a story narrative perspective. Uh, I can't really explain it much better than that. It's weird. You have to like play it like right here. So you're lining up a power blast. You get the ball and you just have to carry it to their end zone without them stopping you. It's a really, really fun game. Uh, Animation looks so freaking cool. 
it's yeah. like Transistor itself was almost hard to describe too of how they approach turn based combat and whatnot. But yeah, Pyre, I can't wait for this. Uh, Super Giant Games, I, they haven't ever made anything less than great. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, last thing I want to touch on for PC title in 2017 is one that's been ongoing for quite a while. But Rob, you finally just dug in recently to Star Citizen. I think because of No Man's Sky <laughs> and Elite Dangerous kind of peaked interest in this. I played a demo at Gamescom. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of looking forward to seeing what content they come out with, see how much closer they're getting to the ideal vision that we all have of it. Yeah. Like, like the first person shooting, the gravitational, like, zero G, zero G combat in outer space, finding this hover bike going onto a planet to help your friends fight this pirate base all seamlessly, you know, which has become such a buzzword recent. Yeah. Months. But I'm looking forward to it. I don't know. Do we know, like, specifically? So, yeah. I mean, I mean sometime 2017, right? This talk right now should be, like, a, a grain of salt just because it's, like, yeah. definitely, like, you, you can definitely say it's not coming out next year. But um, former GameSpot uh, video uh, producer Josh Shaw and I played the other day. And <sighs> what they are doing is they're they're about to, to launch, god dang, I can't remember the patch number, but it's supposed to address... Um, a lot of the main issues with that game, which is for me, having played it, uh, it's just the optimization. I mean, you're you're looking at like just yeah. like ten frames a second, <laughs> like it is almost unplayable. But what what does that mean? I think a lot of people don't understand may, or are unsure. They've gone pretty far so so far. I would say like you can do a lot of cool stuff. Um, you get a general idea. I mean, by no means is this even close to done. I don't think, but. Yeah, just to uh, to say what, what yeah what you were saying is I don't know what the update will the, the update will exactly bring, but I'm pretty sure it's the ability to do like two three missions with your friends like yeah. basically meet up with them at different locations across I believe just maybe a solar solar system more space stations to explore yeah which will give you many more missions in uh, update 3.0. 3.0, which yeah, is yeah. not released yet, but that's the one I saw at Gamescom and they showed me it like. There were a few technical hitches. I remember I like wrote a really extensive preview about it, but there were a few technical hitches. But that was the thing they were worried about was the fact that this character like wasn't holding a glass correctly. It didn't look real. That's what they're worried about at this point. They're just fine tuning it. Uh, the connection looked great. Granted, it was all in one room. Might have been LAN at that point. Uh, I, you were seeing like a like a Chris solid... Roberts and like three people from uh, Cloud Imperium Games were showing me the demo. Okay, and it was like, so that two people on the monitors over here, someone on the main one, and they were showing me like he, these two woke up on the space station. These two were already fighting these pirates down on this planet. Yeah. Uh, I forget how long away. And of course, the light speed jumps are real time. Not our real time, but in the game, like uh, the light speed jumps are like calculated so they will actually take, you know, like if they're going however many light years, it'll still take 10 minutes to get there if you're going that far, but they were in like a neighboring star cluster or something. So it didn't take that long. So they got there saw this, you know, defunct pirate ship up in orbit around this planet where their two co-op teammates, all in the same instance, like already in a co-op game, but not on the same planet in the same area. They saw, like, knew they were on the planet. They were talking to each other. They went, got this hover bike off this ship after killing a few pirates, brought it their ship down, and then ejected the hover bike over the uh, atmosphere. And then they landed on the hover bike, and then it just started careening out of control. And Chris Roberts saying, "I, when it's d ready, that will not happen." But right. it was still cool because then they just went to the pirate bays and helped them out. These two had been fighting for like twenty minutes, and the other two started like woke up, grabbed the mission from the guy while these two were already in the planet. And yeah, so that that just like uh, you know like that mission spanning the galaxy or spanning that solar system at least just sounds so cool to be in a co op game. But you were on Jupiter, I was on. Uh, I don't know, Mercury. Yeah. I'd, I'd be burning alive, but let's not get into the science. Yeah, that's really where it's at right now. It's just like a couple of disjointed pieces, you know, like you can only do this. Like that. right now, we last time I played, it was like, oh, yeah, you can just kind of venture out to this comms array and jumpstart it with a, with a couple of buddies. But what was funny was what happened. We had this random guy get on the ship and we told him to like fly it. It was His name was Agent Cody. And <laughs> yeah. Josh, I was like, Agent Cody, fly the ship. He's like, I've never flown a ship this big. <laughs> we were just like <laughs> chatting and having the time of our life. We get there, pirates blow our ship up. I get jettisoned into this dark, <laughs> deep space. I'm in the chat saying it someone- gravity. <laughs> yeah, I was like, some, someone come save me. Some random guy was like, all right, I'm on my way out. Took him like 10 minutes. He gets out. Same pirates. Kill him. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, thanks for the try. He's like, yeah, whatever. That's what excites me about that game. So far, my, uh, you know, brief experiences, it's always been like a pretty good community. It's like not that many people in it. But I mean, there are a lot of people playing this. This game has a lot of money and, you know, it's constantly oh, yeah. criticized for when's it actually going to be out. But 
the thing I keep telling people is they never promise it's ever going to be like this retail release. It's people are paying for this, like rolling out of updates. You know, I don't think they're great with the timing of the updates. I think they could kind of make better or at least less concrete promises about when they're going to release because this was supposed to be December from what I remember. Uh, now it's not out yet, but hopefully in the next few months, like 2017 will be, you know, Star Citizen will be closer to realizing what that ideal vision is that we all have for it. I'm sure Chris Roberts has for it too. Yeah. But anyway, cool. So those are the PC games we were most looking forward to in 2017. If we missed any, I'm sure we did. Any big ones, any small ones, mention them in the comments below. All right. Jake, I'm going to boot you off for Pete Brown. Pete Brown's usually on here the whole show, but he's been swamped today, and he's too cool for the lobby. Uh, he's coming on right now. He even looks cool walking on. He... I was doing the Rob walk. For, pe for people yeah, listening, he, uh, he's did. got like You're... a Fozzie thing going on. Fonzie thing going on. It's like Fozzie. Fozzie. Fo Fo <laughs> Is that what I said? Fozzie, I'm sick. I've been coughing. I think we're all sick. I am I had a whole weekend of staying in my place, watching two and a half seasons of The Wire. <laughs> It was amazing. It was like so relaxing. I just cleaned. I had headphones on. I was vacuuming. Just like, <laughs> anyways, Wait, I don't want to talk about that. You were in bed. What are you talking about? I was That's both. Impressive. It was both. <laughs> that was that was Sunday, and then Friday, Saturday, I was sick. Yeah. Anyways, all right, we're gonna talk about the most anticipated PS4 games of the good year of our Lord 2017. <laughs> our Lord 2000. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> praise be to 2017. Uh, there's a bunch coming out that I needed to bring Pete on for because I'm not going to play these. I'm Why? just kidding. I'll try to play them. <laughs> um, yeah, so there are a few that we haven't mentioned that would have been an Xbox and PC, but uh, of course, they're multi-platform games. We wanted to spread them out. We'll start with those. Uh, Red Dead Redemption 2. It's not a PS4 exclusive at all, but it's one that a lot of people are excited for. Anytime Rockstar releases something, it's a big deal. We did that whole live stream event to watch the trailer. The trailer is more of a teaser. It didn't show too much. showed this gang of seven people. Uh, the obvious comparison being like Magnificent Seven or something. Uh, they're riding across what you had said would be kind of the original map's northeast section and then like up through the Rockies. So it'd be more Midwest. It seemed like it. Yeah. yeah. It seems Someone, a lot more lush, right? Like right. a lot more wildlife. Well, the map, the map leaked and it really is. It's like if you continued from the northeast of the original game's map up, that's what Red Dead Redemption 2 is. So you're just going toward the Rockies, I guess. Who knows what's going to happen there? All kinds of crazy shit happens Gun in the fights. Rockies. Horse races. Yeah, gunfights. Uh, so Buffalo, Bison are here. They haven't been killed off yet. That's my favorite shot. There's going to be snow, it looks like, more uh, the cold weather. Uh, I think we did like a what we want from Red Dead Redemption 2. And my, uh, you know, this is never going to happen thing, but I still want it anyway, was Grand Theft Auto V's character swapping, the zooming out and zoom back in on Franklin, Michael, or Trevor, <laughs> but with seven people in oh, one gang. Ugh. What? You, okay? you don't need That's that. That's a lot, That's a lot of people. I get that. You don't need that. Um, you don't need that many people in Ocean's Eleven. You don't need that many people in Magnificent Seven. You don't need that many people in Hateful Eight, but they did it anyway. We're talking about movies or video games? Movies. But we could talk about video games. Uh, you didn't need that many people in Grand Theft Auto Five. Three was all right. Like, it was one just enough. Was fine. Seven people <laughs> Nico to Bellic go back had and forth. had it locked down at four. He didn't need other people, but it's it, a cool idea. It's still fun. I think it, I, I'm more inclined to think, that, and that's the other thing we talked about, was that it's an online component where like, you and seven buddies get on your horses. Yeah. And you venture. Yeah. Well, yeah, like the cops and robbers kind of stuff in Grand Theft Auto V would work great for Red Dead Redemption. Yeah. Cops and robbers. Yeah. Like and thieves, so outlaws, and deputies. Even, deputies yeah. even just Grand Theft Auto <laughs> Online. <laughs> right. Even just Grand Theft Auto Online's like premise currently makes more sense in the Wild West, right? Like the biker gangs with horses. Yeah. But just, you know, having it be, you know, a. Ruthless, unorganized, unpoliced part of history, opposed to like just a whole city just that's on fire. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not that I, LA isn't already, but I don't know. Is it? I was just saying. <laughs> I'm not up to date on current events. No, I'm just saying. I would love to just you know walk into the street, turn around, see like Rob's character staring at me with Pan his hand passing over his gun. <laughs> gun. I look just like the gang from Clockwork Orange with the bowler hat. And white onesies and That's overalls. Right. Underwear over it. And then you approach me, go back to the bar, drink milk afterward. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> no, anyway, that would be great to see kind of some sort of, yeah, like you said, kind of like cohesive cooperative experience where I don't know, you could form gangs and roam around. It would seem weird not to based on what they've done with Grand Theft Auto V, the biker gang update. Maybe you were saying you even thought that's like kind of a test subject 
to maybe do it in Red Dead Redemption 2. Yeah. Maybe not that far, but might be kind of, you know, just proof of concept. I mean, Grand Theft Auto Online is the reason why you don't have single player DLC, right? Like, it's a success. Yeah. Like, they made a lot of money and they will continue to. So it just makes sense to test those waters with other ideas. Yeah. Uh, looking forward to it. Definitely. We were talking about, like, where the story might go. You're going to be, it did look like it was John Marston and, uh, was one of those characters and then uh bill the rest of his gang that you're hunting down at the beginning of the first game seems like they're going to be incorporated somehow maybe it's a did we discover if it was a prequel or not that was just based on the fact that he well, it must be a preview or a prequel if like those characters we mentioned are all together as a gang right because you see shots of him on a ranch which i guess you presume even from the vo that it's his yeah i think meaning maybe that this is what these events make him spiral down into yeah. who he was in the first game yeah who knows looking forward to that uh also horizon zero dawn which will be a february release uh february is kind of packed it's yakuza zero is valentine's day for honor is valentine's day horizon horizon zero dawn i forget what exact day it is but they're all february it's kind of loaded no no no, i'm sorry yakuza is january January. 24th with resident evil uh which we'll also talk about resident evil right now um, but Horizon Zero Dawn looks pretty cool. It seems like Far Cry in third person to me where you're hunting robot dinosaurs. Yeah, but hopefully the robot aspect is something fresh. Yeah. Right? And I think there's a lot of opportunities there for you to mix and match parts and create weapons and, and find vulnerabilities in the different robots, which, you know, the game looks really impressive, but that aspect is definitely the thing that has me the most interested there, in the game. There must be some sort of in-depth crafting that would make sense because, like, it seems like you're trying to survive at least one, like, under the watchful gaze of these huge robot cyborg dinosaurs, it would make sense to actually like gather parts from them to craft new things. Cause they've showed some parts where she's just using, using primitive weaponry, kind of like, you know, like right. more stone age uh, kind of stuff or bronze age and whatnot. But then there are later things they showed where it looks like she was kind of, you know, making use of her environment a little more, which that would be an interesting aspect to me. But the overall like kind of cascading waterfall structure of quests as far as, um, there were those like brontosaurus that once she hacked it or something along those lines, or at least an ancient version of it, it looked like it opened up a new area of the map. So maybe it's like the watchtowers from Far Cry, but kind of roaming around. I, I hate to keep comparing it to Far Cry, but these things, when she climbed up this and like hacked into it, it looked like it revealed part of the map nearby. It's like Trico. You just climb on top of his head and jump to the next area. Yeah. We were talking about Last Guardian earlier on the few segments. I don't know. Speaking of heads, I love that like USS Enterprise thing stacked yeah, yeah, on yeah. a neck. It's just like such a, it's like we're doing it. <laughs> it's such a weird blend of like, honestly, like Stone Age and futuristic robots. It's awesome. Like, I think that's what captivated our attention at first. But yeah, I'm hoping the story there is really good because yeah. they've kind of hinted at it, but we don't really have that much to go on at the moment. Yeah, the demos we played that we were just dropped into smaller kind of sandbox areas. Right. Uh, I think Scott and Jake both played. I haven't played yet. I'm looking forward to it. I kind of at this point, I might as well just wait for the full game. But uh, regardless, it looks interesting. Um, yeah, I just mentioned it. Yakuza Zero, the prequel to the first Yakuza. Yes. Uh, okay, so you are a Yakuza fan. Yeah, I sort of been admiring from the sidelines for a while. I played some of the. Uh, one of them on PlayStation three. Um, but yeah, like it's, it's a, it's such a strange series. Cause it, uh, there's like two halves. There's like the really goofy, ridiculous, wacky half that plays like kind of like a, like a, like a little bit of a shoddy arcade game, but it has its charm because it's not really meant to be that, that like involved, right? You're basically just bashing heads and like beating people up in really grotesque, funny ways. And then you have this other half with these really serious, uh, you know, cinematic story moments that are inspired by by Yakuza films, and it's just a it's just a really interesting mishmash because you can you can appreciate it for for what it is in both ways, right? Like the game knows that it's being like dumb and silly when it's being dumb and silly. So you you it's not even that you have to forgive it. It's just that you you pivot and you play a different game for a minute until you get to the next story beat. Um, and the series has done a great job of that so far. Uh, so interesting to see, uh, you know, how Zero sort of sets everything up. Yeah, because then Yakuza Six releases 2018, correct? Right, and then as, we're also uh, as of now. yeah, and then we're also getting Yakuza Kiwami at some point, which is the remake of the original. Okay. There's a lot of Yakuza games coming, which is awesome because for a while it didn't look like we were going to get these. There is one that we will probably never get called Yakuza Ishin, I think, or Isen. It's uh, set in like Edo 
Japan and uh, okay. Yeah, I don't think we're gonna get that one. You'll be re- uh, reviewing Yakuza Zero when it releases in January. You know it. Cool. I've never played any of those. I played Dead Souls a little bit. Dead Souls, which is like way different spinoff, right? Yeah, way different. I mean, you have guns in that, right? Yeah, you don't have guns in these games. Gotcha. P- Peter was showing me clips of uh, Yakuza Zero, and uh, what sold me was the karaoke, just walking yeah. in, <laughs> and you just like dish out some songs and get out and yeah. just continue on. Yeah, I, it What's looked, up? it just looks so great. Uh, yeah, it's, it's it's actually this game is so similar to Shenmue that I feel like people need to kind of forget about Shenmue Three for a while and just focus on Yakuza because what is Shenmue 3 going to be? It's really hard to put your finger on it, but we know what Yakuza is going to be. It's it's taking that sort of open world formula that it, it actually, and it's made by Sega. It's published by Sega. I mean, it looks so similar to, to Shenmue in, in that regard, like the way the world looks and how you interact with people. And it's filled with things like arcade games and UFO catchers and all this stuff that you can do just to fuck off and have fun in the world. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm looking for, maybe that'll be my like first full Yakuza game. Who knows? It's also the same day as Resident Evil, which I want to talk about Resident Evil. Sorry. <clears throat> Pretty sick this week. Uh, Resident Evil 7, Biohazard. I played about four hours of it recently for a demo at Capcom Japan. I can't say enough good things based on that demo. Uh, I think I played about a third of the game they told me. So I have another, or a third wow. or a quarter. <clears throat> but I also kind of breezed through it because I, I had just played Resident Evil Remake. And again, this is like remake in first person almost in You're a lot so of respects. You're so good at games. <laughs> I'm, plus, I'm really fucking good at video games. So <laughs> that's also a factor. Uh, I can't wait for this. Between being on PSVR and being able to swap between PSVR and regular, you know, standard watch playing it on a screen, that seems alluring within the same playthrough. Uh, the fact that save rooms are returning, there's more, you know, survival, saving your bullets, deciding whether to craft health packs or bullets. Uh, the fact that a lot of the, you know, the Baker family is kind of chasing you. There's Jack Baker behind you with a shovel right now for people watching. Guys. Uh, it's set in this mansion, this, like, it's an old school Louisiana plantation, a defunct plantation, but this, you know, cannibalistic family is chasing you. It just looks like, you know, that Capcom's been saying forever, and we were saying earlier on the show, a lot of developers are going back to their roots, kind of, whether it be with Zelda Breath of the Wild or Doom or Resident Evil. It seems like a lot of them are kind of getting in touch with what made the series that they're working on great to begin with. This seems like it's an exemplar of that, and I can't wait to play more of it. It was pretty tense, but it was also the... Puzzle solving was there in spades, but also getting keys to go through certain rooms, kind of, you know, like... <laughs> just walk through that. Yeah. That wall just crumbled as he, <laughs> and then he just yeah. stood casually there. casually walked through it. Yeah. Don't mind me, I'm just a powerhouse. <laughs> there, There is some really goofy justification for that in the game, I will okay. tell you, but I won't spoil it. Uh, and then, you know, like the, the story structure between... You're in this mansion as Ethan looking for your wife or ex-wife, Mia. Uh, she's been here for a while, and you're trying to figure out what Marguerite and Jack Baker have done with her. Uh, and then there's Lucas as well, one of the sons of the grandma. I forget her name. But you're really getting to know these deranged characters while you're navigating the grounds. And I already, like, the layout of this mansion is already burned into my brain, and I haven't even seen all of it because I didn't get, like, the scorpion key or whatever I needed to unlock the last three doors. Uh, it just feels like a classic Resident Evil, but, you know, with modern sensibilities. Obviously, first person is a big deal for a Resident Evil game, but I can't wait for this. This will be January 24th as well. Uh, did you guys get the chance to play any of this yet? Rob, you played a couple demos. You both played a couple demos. Beginning Hour and the Lantern demo. That's and then all they, I've played. Then they January. updated Beginning Hour to be the Midnight demo. Okay, yeah, and I played just the Lantern demo on VR, and, I don't know, the more I see footage, the more I think, like, shh. Shit, I might have a heart attack if I played a whole game <laughs> like in VR. Like, yeah. I don't know, man. I, it feels good because you you just to aim. It does feel good. Look, yeah, wherever you want to shoot when you have weapons. Uh, it's like people kind of give VR games with the crouch mechanic shit when you just snap to. But I turned it off and like the actual act of crouching down, the camera moving, made me actually kind of sick. I don't really get motion sick mm-hmm. ever. Uh, this game like snapping to it made it much better even though it doesn't look real but um yeah yeah minor things aside you can customize a lot of that in vr for uh psvr for resident evil 7 yeah but i'm a huge advocate for that game i mean i'm <laughs> there are some people who are stronger willed than i i know that but like yeah. it is something cool to be said as far as being able you know you're you know you're being chased and someone's yeah. looking for you with, with the lantern and you're being able to like p- you know peek through the actual walls and do all these really like intricate like as far as uh looks and and movements that like i think um really like made it more immersive and scary 
Yeah, I've talked about Resident Evil 7 a lot between like podcasts and just previews and lobby discussions, and I can't wait for it. I can't say enough about the time I took to play it, and I'm looking forward to it. Uh, but Pete, Persona 5, hmm. I'm not a Persona fan. I don't have any reason not to be. I just haven't played them. Tell me why I should be excited for 5, should I, or should I? I think that you should. Um, I So I really like the Shin Megami Tensei games, which are sort of an offshoot of, or I guess Persona is an offshoot of Shin Megami Tensei. Um, and Persona 4 was a sort of a an RPG that everyone loved, right? Um, but 5 seems to be delving a little bit more into like darker themes, right? 4 was very much about slice of life type things. This game is set in Tokyo and these kids sort of like wake up to these alternate um, personalities they have called personas, these sort of like supernatural alter egos. And they, they delve into this like netherworld to deal with like adults that have like horrible like immoral motivations and they try to like quell that and, and like this game deals with a lot of like personal and social issues um but then it presents it with this like bright poppy really stylish exterior so i think it's just got like a lot of things going for it uh both in terms of you know the narrative the way it looks uh and then the combat as well which is a mix of sort of like you know people with guns but also their supernatural counterparts and is it it's turn-based combat correct yeah yeah that's what i assumed but yeah I'm looking forward to it. I still haven't played Persona 4. That's been on my list for like five years that now. That game is also like 100 hours long. I think you can safely wait and just play this. All right. Yeah. I'll do that. Uh, another one that you just played a few minutes ago, mm -hmm. I think, Near Automata. Yeah. So the sequel to the 2009, 2010 cult classic. Is it even a sequel? It's just a, it's a follow-up. It's, a, it's, a, it's got a subtitle, but Near yeah. was 2010. Cult classic, uh, just kind of this, uh, I don't know, weird open world uh, RPG with questionable action mechanics. So to correct that with Automata, they brought in Platinum Games, who's also working on, um, you know, uh, they worked Scalebound. on Metal Gear Rising. Re they're working on Scalebound right now. Right. Yeah, they also did, you know, Metal Gear Rising Revengeance and Bayonetta. But Near Automata, P, you and I both played the demo. Mm -hmm. I like this game a lot so far. Yeah, uh, it's got that that Platinum sort of melee combat going on for it, which uh, always feels great. Um, and it's got an interesting presentation that I don't even know what you'd categorize it as. It's sort of like gothic j-pop meets metal gear kind of yeah i guess so you're these androids sent down from the moon where humans escaped to when robots took over right. the earth yeah exactly to battle the robots yeah and um, uh, clear it for humans to come back but as you can see here your character has this sort of like ai or a little robotic buddy floating behind her and that sort of opens up some like arcade shooter elements uh Sort of in the way that Fury does as well, if you played that game, um, where you get to go in and do close combat with a sword, but you can also fire from afar. And it all actually meshes really well together, um, even though the game tends to hop around in terms of the perspective. So sometimes mm -hmm. you're in a side-scrolling environment. Other times it's a top-down perspective. Mm -hmm. And then you have the sort of you know regular third-person, like 360-degree uh, action game like you see here. It's just a, a really interesting mix of mechanics and presentation. Yeah, the camera work was great from the demo I played and then it became like a bullet hell at certain points when you're dodging projectiles and shooting the people that are shooting at you. Uh, yeah, to mention that robot <coughs> floating around next to you, those are that's one of the pods, I believe. So you yeah. get pods that let you do these like special attacks like uh, yeah. shoot these spears out in a sphere around you or just surround yourself with these shields that deflect you know projectiles back at enemies. Yeah, I, I don't feel weird making a Metal Gear comparison, like especially because the combat feels similar to Rising, but there's also like an alternate skin for that robot that is a cardboard box skin. Really? Yeah, like they're, they're being subtle about it in a way, but they're also not. I mean, I think this game is just going to be a great marriage of different ideas that just happens to have the near title. Yeah. I don't I don't know why. I, yeah. I really can't put my finger on it because the first game, like... It's the same storyline and it's... this. Is so it? this isn't... Yeah, it's the same, like, it's set, I think... Well, it's set millennia after right. the first one, but it's the same world, same idea of, uh, you know, cyborgs being sent back down to Earth okay. to battle robots, but it's also open world, which we haven't seen, obviously, in the demo. The demo is this one small bite-sized chunk. Uh, I haven't fought this boss. He's at the end of the demo, but uh, they, uh, Platinum stopped me before I could finish it. But yeah, I don't know. It, it seems like Platinum could just release any game with any name, and we would know it's Platinum and hope for the best. I Sometimes, guess. yeah. Yeah, that's what <laughs> hope Jake for was the best. Earlier. Yeah. yeah. Um, what's What's cool about this game is that they're totally embracing the the Japanese style for the international release because the first near they actually remodeled the character for Western releases. Okay. So in the West, we got this like really barbaric, ugly looking dude. And in Japan, they got like a, a, a pretty looking, like, you know, Japanese hero type. I'm offended. 
it's it's like I don't know. I mean, it's not like a huge sticking point for me, but it's just I don't know. I'm glad that Platinum can just go you know as far as they want to and yeah. the sort of things that they they love. Yeah, it's one that was under the radar for me, and then I played a demo and loved it. I've been trying to champion it here. Uh, we have a demo now. Everybody should try it out. But uh, yeah, so those are our PS4 games. Uh, I'm sure we missed a few, and like we said, there are a lot of multi-platform ones we already talked about on Xbox One. But uh, if you, we miss any big ones or we miss any ones that you wanted to mention, let us know in the comments below. So that is the show today, and that is the last episode of whatever season of the lobby this is. Three? Season three. Yeah. Mm. And mm. We're, uh, we're, yeah, uh, right. we're up there now. <laughs> yeah. So we'll be starting again in a couple of weeks after uh, the holidays, and, and we're back in the office ready to start 2017 with Yakuza 0, Resident Evil 7. We have a lot of games coming up. Hopefully we'll start getting them soon. I'm looking forward to it, but I have a lot of holiday games to finish up do you guys have any like backlog games you're planning on over oh, the holidays yeah, dude. i mean like <laughs> so, what I, i'm sure you do what are the ones you're really trying to get through <sighs> titanfall 2 i got it <laughs> <laughs> you haven't played that much yet nah, no. not as much as i like no uh so many man like i think one of the ones that uh i had to like kind of rip the band-aid on and play other ones was uh uh i want to finish the witcher blood and wine oh and, yeah like i, mean, I was it. having a great time with that and then had to put it down and that's a game where it's like okay Let's see my calendar. How's it looking for the next two weeks? Because yeah. it's not a game that, you know, it takes about 30 minutes just to like go through my inventory and, and remember what the hell I was doing with that broadsword. You know yeah. what I mean? Like that shit is taxing. But uh, God, yeah, there are a lot that I would say. I can't think of anything right now. Yeah. That so I finally lot. got like past halfway in The Last Guardian and I against my wishes i have started to like that game a lot like mm -hmm. people kept telling me that there'd be a point and just to be stubborn i was like no i still don't like it and then like last night i was like all right i like it trico's all right He's trico's cool. pretty good trico's pretty cool pretty cool the boy is annoying me now though so i'm just I'm finding things to annoy me but no i, I really like Yukio. that game. Yeah. <laughs> i don't even know what he's Yuriko. saying to toriko toriko it's japanese for prisoner i think really is that where trico comes from it's a derivation of that yeah gotcha what are you playing Oh, man, I don't know. <laughs> don't put me on the spot. I, there's a lot of stuff. Have reviews coming up over the holiday, won't you? I'll probably be playing Yakuza Zero. <laughs> Word. Yeah. Gotcha. Yep. Yeah. Same. I mean, I'll probably finish up Last Guardian this week and then finish up Final Fantasy. Yeah. I got to the end of Dishonored Two, and I <laughs> really like Dishonored Two. I'm happy I finally plowed through that. I keep seeing people saying that they're, they've beat Final Fantasy by showing the sort of like end slate that you get after you beat the game. But man, there's so much more yeah. to that game. I feel like I want people to just rush through the story and keep playing the other stuff. Yeah. Sounds like what like a bachelor's degree offers in like right. real life. <laughs> oh man. Oh really? <laughs> no, that's the, they <laughs> got the hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> that's the associate's degree to get your bachelor's. You actually have to play sixty hours. Yeah. Mm. Your master's, you have to take down that turtle god thing. And yeah, maybe I'll do that. Maybe that'll be no. I'm not gonna. Do if you do, are you are you really gonna try that? Or what's that? What's that one dungeon that's like people say will never ever get navigated all the way? Oh, the crazy puzzle one. Yeah, there's like a in the official strategy guide which we got to like try to make some guide content for the site. It has a section for that dungeon and it says, "This is too complex to represent with words and images. You have to watch a video." Here's a URL. <laughs> oh my god, it's not good. Uh, I don't know if I want to do that. No, I've already put in like 75 hours in that game, so I've yeah, gotten a lot. I think of, you've done it. Of it. There's a lot of games I want to go back to. The Division right. is probably number one. Yeah, survival mode sounds awesome. Survival mode, Darkest Dungeon, which like I really regret like not putting it, or at least like bringing it up more during Game of the Year because it was so early in the year. Um, then what else? Like just something. Oh, like uh, Resident I Evil Four, Hyperlight Drifter, I Hyperlight Drifter. Oh, yeah, 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 that's uh, a great game. You should play that. I was telling him once I, having seen a lot of the art style, I watched uh, the opening uh, scene of that game. Madness. Blue blew my mind yeah. <laughs> and then when i saw a gameplay of uh i wasn't sure what that game was it reminded me a lot of i can't remember um transistor mm -hmm. which i respect but i didn't know if i could like invest time into it but w right when i saw uh the map layout right, of right. hyperlight drifter i was like oh this is zelda like yeah, yeah. done like yeah. downloaded so i can't wait to play that one yeah yeah game's great <coughs> all right anyway that's a show uh, last of the year, so we are looking forward to starting next year. But this whole week, uh, Game of the Year stuff is winding down. We're going to be publishing it, but we're almost done working on it. So we will be publishing that for everybody the next few weeks. Our top 25 games will be coming out. We're doing it a bit differently this year. So Monday, December 20th, we are going to be doing a five-hour live stream from 10 a.m. till 3 p.m. So at 10, we're going to announce number five game of the year, and then we're going to right after we do this like if we did a lobby set discussion right after we uh show that on the stream here on twitch or GameSpot, wherever you want to watch it we're going to be playing the game for another hour a few of us 
Uh, and then we're going to show some videos that were made about it throughout the year, whether they're features or whether maybe the video review will be shown. Then f game four will be at 11 a.m., 12 p.m., and so forth. Number one game will be announced 2 p.m., usually the time of the lobby, but again, this is the last episode, so that's when we're going to announce our game of the year. So stick around for that. We have a lot going on uh, Tuesday, December 20th. It'll be pretty tiring. Uh, Pete and I will be swapping out to host. Rob will be on a bunch of the segments. We'll pretty much try to get as many GameSpot people through here to talk about the games as possible. Um, then we also have a Space Hulk stream some point this week. I think today, later Wednesday, today. Which Wednesday. Which is tomorrow. Tomorrow. Morning. Space Hulk. Is it four-player co-op? Uh, yeah, that? I believe so. We'll try to do that. Uh, Mary um, and I are going to play that. Maybe some other people in the office will join cool. in. But that game looks pretty cool. And then yeah, I'll, I'll sit in with you guys. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. And later on today, I think Bully. Scott and somebody is going to be playing Bully. It's backwards compatible now, but it's also like in the December sale for PS4, interestingly hmm. enough. So I guess it's just like a good time to play Bully. It's always a good time. Uh, yeah, but then we have, we have, I feel like we have a lot of streams. There's going to be a Battlefield, the new DLC That's we're right. getting soon. So we'll probably stream that this week. We're going to be doing a lot of live streams is my main point because it's winding down here at the GameSpot office. Anyway, as always, thank you to Jean-Luc in the back, Mary in the back, Eric Tay, Richard Lee, who's not here on camera today, but uh, he usually does a great job. Anyway, thank you so much for uh, joining us every episode of this season. It's been great being the host uh, in the absence of Danny O'Dwyer. I'm sure we'll keep getting Rob and Pete on here a lot. No. But uh, yeah, we look forward to seeing you during that Game of the Year live stream. And if you can't make it, we will see you next year.